Welcome to today's Agora online event. My name is Nicola Bock. I'm head of events at Agora Energiewende. Today's topic is making renewable hydrogen cost competitive, policy instrument for supporting renewable hydrogen. And why is this on the agenda? Well, it's a hot topic. You can tell from the numbers of people who registered for the event. And um, this is also why Agora Energie Vendor commissioned a study to Guidehouse, which is a global provider of consulting services, and to the law firm Becker Büttner Held, BBH. And today is the day where we are going to publish the study. I can show you the title of it. And if everything went well, you should be able to already download it from our website. The colleagues were preparing everything to have it go live right now with the start of the event. And my colleague will put the link to the study into the chat window so you can have a look at it after the webinar because you, will, you are lucky because we will introduce you to the study beforehand so you will all already get sort of like the main results. Now, what's, how are the next one and a half hours going to be structured? We will have two presentations first on the possible policy instruments, one by a colleague from Agora Energie Vendor and the other one from a colleague from Guidehouse. Um, fun fact, both are called Matthias, uh, so don't get confused. And um, after that, we will have two interventions or comments, by one by a representative from CEFIC, the European Chemical Industry Council, and one by a representative from the European Commission. After that, there will be time for a Q&A session. And um, you may know how Zoom works already, but I'm still going to introduce you to how we are going to use it today as the view only audience, um, there are two ways for you to get in contact with us. And you see at the bottom of your screen, I have a little control monitor here to see what you see. You see two boxes. One is the chat box and one is the Q&A or F&A box. And um, you can put any organizational and technical questions into the chat box, is it, which will be um, looked after by my colleague Maxi Marzanke from the events team at Agora Energy Event, and maybe Maxi, you can quickly switch on your camera so the audience see you're not a robot. Thank you for looking after the chat. And everything that you put into the chat, the audience will remain invisible for the rest of the audience. We will also use the chat to give you relevant links, for instance, to the presentations which will be shown and also to the study and a few other things. Then you have the Q&A box, and this is reserved for your content-related questions. So anything that comes up to your mind while you're listening and following the presentations and the commentaries, put it in there. If it is addressed to a specific person on the panel, put the name there. That's going to make it easier for us. We do have quite a big crew looking after the Q&As or after your questions, because from our experience, there are usually quite a lot of questions. And um, maybe I will introduce this crew also to you. Um, it, my colleague Nievomir Flis from Agora Energiewende will be sort of heading this crew. And then we also have two colleagues from our partners, um, Pia Keres, from Guidehouse and Christine Kleem from uh, Becker Büttner Held. And um, hello, Pia, and also hello, Christine. If you could just quickly switch on your camera so the audience sees you. It's great that we have you here to look after the questions to make sure that um, we get the, um, the ones with the broadest interest for the entire audience onto the podium in the Q&A session. Um, one more information to the audience, whatever you put in there remains invisible until we pick it for the Q&A session or until it is answered in writing, because the questions that are sort of quickly answered, um, we will try to answer in writing to make sure that um, we yeah, address a, a good number of them. Um, we are recording this webinar in order to publish it on our website afterwards. And um, yeah, as I said, I do have a control monitor here to see what you see and to make sure that uh, everything is uh, running smoothly. And with this, I'm going to hand over to Frank Peter, 
director of the industry team at Agora Energiewende. And he will be taking care of the moderation of the webinar. And I will stop now sharing my screen. You can still let us know from where you're tuned in from. Um, and we see it's a wide range of countries uh, represented, which is great. And with this, I hand over the microphone to you, Frank. The floor is yours. Thank you very much, Nicola, for the introduction and also giving us uh, the rules and uh, the operations of Zoom. Um, we want to talk today on uh, how we make renewable hydrogen cost competitive. Um, we all know that uh, renewable green hydrogen is a key pillar of climate neutrality uh, in the future. We know it will play an essential role in uh, decarbonizing the industrial sector, um, helping transport to become climate neutral, or even to supply um, things in, in, in flight transport going forward. So um, without green hydrogen, uh, one cannot see a climate neutrality future to be achieved in the future. Um, but as it is already stated, uh, within the European Commission's hydrogen strategy, renewable hydrogen is at the moment much more uh, costly than conventional hydrogen technologies. And um, how to get down this cost is one of the key questions uh, that we need to solve in the next decade, because we want to establish an hydrogen economy well before 2030 to have a substantial um, a substantial share of emissions reduction that can be already delivered by an ramping up in hydrogen economy before 2030. And uh, this is what we want to make happen. And we are in uh, essential need of policy instruments that can address this cost disadvantage that green hydrogen at the moment has. We have, um, with that study, done um, a new piece of work on hydrogen that lines up in a, in a range of, um, in a series of reports that we have done on hydrogen. You may be aware of the No Regret Hydrogen Study. We just uh, published a, a couple of months ago. We also have hydrogen work done in South, Af in South Africa, where we um, all expect that it eventually may be an exporter of green hydrogen in the future. So hydrogen is uh, at, the, at the key, um, also at the, at the heart of Agora's work at the moment going forward. And we are happy to um, share here today our new insights on what are the policy instruments that can eventually help to ramp up a green hydrogen economy in Europe. Um, I would like to introduce now the, the lineup of people that we have brought to this event today that will um, give you the insights of the study and of course, help us also in the discussion to put more light onto different aspects of the discussions whether a hydrogen economy uh, is feasible in the near term, how it could look like, and how it should be also addressed from a policy perspective. Um, Matthias Deutsch, my Agora colleague, uh, as Nicola already mentioned, will give us a short overview of our key insights, our key learnings from the study. Um, he will be followed up by Matthias Schimmel from Guidehouse, one of our main consultants to dig us a bit deeper into the details of the study. And then Nicola Rega from uh, CEFIC um, will give us an, an intervention on how the chemical industry may eventually see the role of green hydrogen, also our policy instruments that we are discussing. And we have um, the honor also to bring Henning Ehrenstein in from European Commission DG Grow. Uh, he will join us a bit later today, um, but he will be there for his intervention and the panel discussion we will have afterwards. And uh, finally, we have uh, Corinna Klesmann, uh, also uh, working for, for Guidehouse, uh, being a, a lead author uh, of the report to help us in the, in the discussion to answer all of your questions that come up. Um, well, with that a great bunch of people available for discussions, uh, Matthias uh, Deutsch, I would like to hand over to you to give us uh, the, the key insights from the Agora perspective. 
Thank you, Frank. Uh, thank you very much, all of you, for coming. We at Agora are a think tank around 100 people. We're independent, nonpartisan. And within this, we kind of scope and set up our own work. And as Frank already alluded to, one of the most recent publications that we came up with is on a climate neutral Germany. And what we figured in this publication on climate neutral Germany by 2045 as a contribution to the European Green Deal, there is hydrogen in there already by 2030. And I'll, I'll show you a little bit more what, which, which volumes of hydrogen are needed by 2030. What you can see here in terawatt hours per year is a hydrogen demand for low carbon hydrogen of around 60 terawatt hours by 2030 already. And it starts with the dark colors, that's uh, power sector, renewables back up, district heating, goes up to industry, a little bit of road freight transport. This is what we need. And then there's even a need for PTL, which is not power to liquid, which is not shown in this uh, diagram. So we have come up with this techno-economic analysis of strategies for climate neutrality in Germany, but we didn't come up with the policy instruments needed. And we wondered how can we make this happen to deliver the hydrogen needed in the applications that need it. And so we come up, came up with this new project with Guidehouse. We commissioned Guidehouse and the law firm Becker Büttner Held, and we asked them which policy instruments are best suited to bring the green hydrogen to deliver it to the applications that need it to become climate neutral. And so we are coming up with this report today uh, you find policy instrument fact sheets in the appendix to the report. You find legal analysis a bit later. This is forthcoming, let's say, the end of the summer, where we will publish uh, separately legal analysis of the instruments. And again, keep in mind, this is motivated by the German discussion on climate neutrality. But we think we can enlarge this strategically to cover more, to give strategic advice and thinking to the discussion at the EU level. And this is what we are attending attending here to you today. And so what I'm delivering here is our conclusions, the Agora conclusions based on Guidehouse's analysis. So you find two parts in the publication. I'm showing the conclusions here. This is broadly in line with Guidehouse. You will see a bit later, there's one point in particular where we, our conclusions differ a little bit from the Guidehouse uh, recommendations and assumptions. I'll tell you a bit later. So let's start with our conclusions. The first conclusion is there's a limited set of applications in all sectors that need renewable hydrogen to become climate neutral. What do we mean by that? Everybody wants green hydrogen these days, apparently. Let's give it a bit more structure. Think about it more strategically. Let's, let's do a table. And so the, in the shiny colors, green, yellow, red, you see uncontroversial, controversial, and bad idea. And what we mean with uncontroversial is there are specific chemical properties, there's a high energy density, or there's a storability of hydrogen that makes it really uncontroversial across different sectors. In industry, it's steelmaking or feedstock for chemicals. In transport, it's long-haul aviation, maritime shipping. In the power sector, it's backing up renewables. And then for buildings, a bit indirectly, it's district heating. If, if you can't cover your entire district heating with 100% renewables, there may be something like a residual heat load that you have to meet and supply and that maybe where hydrogen have a role in different heating systems that exist today. There's a second line with controversial stuff and there's competition. There's competition, more competition with direct electrification. And that's true for industry, high temperature heat. It's true for trucks and buses. We, we acknowledge that if you are, have your trucks maybe close to a port or an industry cluster uh, that may be kind of in favor of hydrogen, but it's definitely controversial. And then there's short haul aviation and shipping and, and finally, there are bad ideas where we think the energy conversion losses associated with hydrogen make it a bad idea relative to direct electrification of low temperature heat, both in industry and in buildings, similar for cars and light duty vehicles. So this is the situation as we see it on the demand side, when we talk about who really needs green molecules to become climate neutral. On the supply side, we see a cost gap as does Frank already alluded to. And so the question is, what can we make out of the cost gap? And we think there's extra policy needed. Let's have a look at the cost gap. You see here hydrogen cost in euros per kilogram. And then you see fossil-based hydrogen, fossil-based hydrogen with carbon capture. Both have a CO2 price of 50 euros factored in, in, uh, in purple. And it's around, roughly around two euros per kilogram. And then you see green renewable hydrogen 
with a range between three and six, nearly seven euros per kilogram. This is a compilation of studies you see in the footnote. It's broadly based on Bloomberg New Energy Finance, Hydrogen Europe, Gas for Climate, and our own publications. And it's a big range. And then we show this horizontal line to say, look, on average, if you take the middle of that range, there is a huge cost gap. At the same time, we know that project developers all over the planet have a project pipeline of electroly electrolyzers of between 30 and 90 gigawatts. What, what do they want to do? How do they want to bridge this cost gap that I've been showing to you? Are they anticipating a higher willingness to pay among customers? Kind of, will all the customers pay a huge price premium? Or are they betting on some kind of policy support here? We don't know. That's interesting. But we just observe the cost of renewable hydrogen need to go down. And there are three big factors for this. One is the cost of renewable electricity. And we think renewable electricity is, has been on track and will further be on track to become cheaper anyway. It's an exogenous development. It's autonomous. It's happening. So this is not the key thing where we need additional policy. Then there are two other factors, the annual operating hours of the electrolyzer and the electrolyzer system cost. And let's have a look at the interplay of those two factors, because the question is, how can policies influence the cost? Additional policies, how can they additionally influence the cost of renewable hydrogen? And when we look at the interplay of operating hours or capacity factor and electrolyzer system cost or capital expenditure, we get kind of this classic diagram where you have hydrogen production cost in euro per kilogram on the y-axis, and then you have the hours per year, the annual operating hours. And the basic insight is, okay, so your co production costs go down if you have more operating hours. I mean, that's not new to you, most likely. The question is, uh, what can we learn from this in terms of capital expenditure? And the different colors indicate different electrolyzer system costs, starting from around 600 euro per kilowatt, going down to around 160 euros per kilowatt. So the insight here is it's good if you can spread your investment cost over as many hours per year as possible. That helps you in bringing down costs. If you have around 600 euros per kilowatt, you need about more than 5,400 hours to get your cost down to a range that it's somehow comparable to the range that I showed you before, around roughly around two euros per kilogram fossil-based hydrogen with or without carbon capture at a CO2 price of 50 euros per ton. If you can, and that's the key insight here, if you can get capital expenditure down to 160 euro per kilowatt, you just need 1,500 hours. That's sufficient to get into that magic range of around two. And this is actually can be done, could be achieved even with solar PV alone in Southern Europe at good locations. So down at the bottom of the diagram, you see some indicative ranges of how the renewables in Europe could make a contribution with their followed hours to reaching uh, the, those number of operating hours per year. Now, this is a simplified illustration. We totally acknowledge that, and it gets way more complicated if you connect your electrolyzer to the grid, and then the cost structure gets more difficult. However, this is to underline that Capital expenditure system costs of electrolysis are an important factor in this. And the question is, how can they get down? What could be done to get them down? And I'm now presenting a slide that you have seen in one way or another in many publications. It's essentially cost in euro per kilogram of hydrogen over time, the 2020s. And it looks so nice because in green, you see how the renewable hydrogen goes down. Again, it's a big range from all those publications that we have screened. And then you see fossil-based hydrogen with or without carbon capture going up because we, underlying, uh, we have an underlying assumed a CO2 price starting from 50 euros per ton today, going up to 100 euros per ton. And yeah, the lines intersect. So are we done? Is, is renewable hydrogen becoming cheaper anyway? I think that's the confusing part that many diagrams usually don't show. There is nothing automatic about those cost reductions. Someone needs to pay the learning curve. All those analysts to deal with the learning curves, they assume implicitly that there's deployment going on. And with each kind of cumulative doubling of deployment, they have an assumption usually built in how costs will get reduced through this. 
So that's the magic of the learning curve, but somebody needs to deploy to make that happen. And again, keep in mind, there's a cost gap. So who would do that? Now, electrolyzer manufacturers who have to contribute to the overall cost reduction need a predictable pipeline of projects to invest into this new kind of bigger scale gigafactory size that we want to see to get the cost down. Predictability only works with policy support because there's this cost gap that I showed you. If we want to use taxpayers' money to invest have, to securing this predictability, we need some basic agreement where to put this taxpayer money. And therefore, we strongly recommend to put it into the uncontroversial, the least controversial applications that really need renewable hydrogen to become climate neutral. Now, policy is a big term. Um, the policy is, is really important for this. And one of the key and flagship policies in Europe that we are kind of proud of is, oh, we have an ETS. Th that's great. The big question is, can it deliver for this particular purpose? And our next conclusion is that the ETS with the prices that we expect for the 2020s, it will not be high enough to deliver this stable demand for renewable hydrogen. So this re reinforces the need for a stable policy framework that goes beyond ETS. But let me show you, illustrate this, um, what we mean by this. You see now, this is a different unit. Now it's euro per megawatt hour, but it's still hydrogen cost. And you see on the x-axis, you see the cost of carbon dioxide or the ETS price. It's going from zero to 300. And then with all the bars, it's always um, a, a set of four bars in the colors that you see in the legend, natural gas, fossil-based hydrogen, fossil-based with carbon capture and renewable hydrogen. And the colors somehow indicate what we mean by that. So you see for the green one, that's key. Still remember this big cost range for green. And since we have this huge cost range for green hydrogen, we put this horizontal line in there to show what the average price is. And now just compare the horizontal line with all those bars. And this average is usually much above all the others. What does that mean? Well, you can put a CO2 price on top of all those energy carriers and still the average hydrogen cost is above that if you just compare the energy carriers here. So even at a CO2 price of 100 to 200, look at the, the dark gray, it's still below the horizontal line in green. The fossil-based is below. So how do we gonna organize this switch? So we need additional policy support to get this job done. Uh, we cannot rely on the ETS only to deliver because honestly, ETS prices of 100 to, to two or 300 euros, that's not anything that's easily said to some industry stakeholders, and we'll talk about that a bit later. For the instruments that we can have for this, we think that what some people think is the easiest solution, having a general green renewable hydrogen quota on everything for natural gas is not sufficiently targeted to really deliver what we need in our target applications. So let's talk about more targeted policy instruments. That's actually kind of the domain of what Matthias Schimmel from Guiders will talk about a bit later, but I'll give you a very short overview of what he'll present later then. We have, we need a policy framework, and it's kind of, this uh, has many facets because we want to target different applications. And I'm going not through the details of this table and just an extract from the larger table in the publication that you should look up, but I'm going through the text on the right-hand side. So we need carbon contracts for difference. That's key for industry. We want to kickstart the transition to climate neutral products. That's about global competition. Climate neutrality is about a global competition in climate neutral products. Second, we need a power to liquid quota, PTL quota. This is actually where we devi deviate a little bit from Guidehouse. They uh, suggested 5% by 2030. We're suggesting 10% by 2030. Why? Because we need to signal to countries around Europe on this planet that Europe will most likely need to import considerable volumes of liquid e-fuels. So please prepare for this. Ramp up your fissure trapped capacities. We'll need that, and you should know that. So that's the signaling function of this insight here. We need gas power plants. Uh, this is not so much covered for the European dimension. It's more on the German uh, CHP law that we have intended here. We need scalable green lead markets. We need hydrogen supply contracts. That's something that has been picked up in Germany under the heading of H2 Global. So this is similar in spirit. And finally, if we sum up just the cost of policy support at the European level, just to give you the flavor, it's an indicative range. 
uh, you may say that something is missing or so, but it's the range of around 10 to 24 billion per annum needed to make this happen, to bridge the cost gap. This, I think, is important. Matthias Schimmel will elaborate more on the, on the details of the instruments, but this is the core of the project, is the contribution on thinking creatively about instruments that can deliver the hydrogen to the right applications. There's one thing that we should also mention. It's about hydrogen is not just hydrogen. There, there's more to be said. What about the sustainability and system integration implications? Let's have a look at the life cycle emission intensity of hydrogen by production route. And this is in gram CO2 per kilowatt hour. And what you see is, starting on the left, we start with fossil-based hydrogen, then in blue, fossil-based with carbon capture. And then the three others are electrolysis. And you see there are considerable differences. So let me walk you through this. The green one to the right is most sustainable with 100% renewable energy sources. If it's not the case, otherwise, this can lead to very high CO2 emissions. Look in the middle. Electrolysis is based on the German grid mix in 2018. I mean, it's not the same today, but 2018 is not that, that long ago. So we need clear criteria for climate neutrality, what we mean by sustainability, and we need to think about a roadmap for applying the criteria. It's like answering the question, can we phase them somehow in if someone needs maybe a different treatment here, like industry? We think industry is not the same as transport. Industry has different needs and investment and reinvestment cycles, and we should pay attention to that. Therefore, the idea of applying the criteria in a differentiated way. We need appropriate siting of electrolyzers. This is true for uh, sustainability and system integration reasons. There are bottlenecks, grid bottlenecks across Europe. Uh, I can tell you in Germany, we know a lot about that. And we cannot allow that renewable hydrogen makes those bottlenecks even worse. Then we would that would not be a big contribution to system integration and sustainability. And then the other thought here is on fossil-based hydrogen with carbon capture. So the left part, the blue part of the diagram, look at the, the height of the bar. It has a similar emission intensity as electrolysis with a grid intensity of 100 gram CO2 per kilowatt hour. So the middle green one. It, it's a range because there is assumptions on different capture rates, but it's somehow similar. Economically, we think that uh, fossil-based hydrogen with carbon capture does not need additional policy support. So this is different from the rest of the report, which is on renewable hydrogen. And then we need to think about sustainability of fossil-based hydrogen with carbon capture as well. I mean, we are, we are looking towards climate neutrality. So there needs to be strong sustainability criteria here as well. There needs to be a ratcheting up mechanism. In the end, climate neutrality is about no emissions. So if you can't capture everything for this kind of hydrogen, you would need to organize negative emissions to compensate for the residual emissions, just to keep that in mind, what it means to walk towards climate neutrality. This, I think, is the bigger picture on emissions intensity and what we need to uh, in order to uh, comply and, and cover that aspect. And now let's get to the final slide from my side. The final point. Without this final point, there simply will be no renewable hydrogen, not the renewable hydrogen in the quantities we need. It's not going to work. The final insight is about the basis. It's about renewable hydrogen that needs major additional renewable energy deployment. It's a lot of wind and solar. Around today, we are at around 300 gigawatts of installed capacity in Europe. And when you look at the climate target impact assessment of the European Commission, you see that we need something in the order of 800 gigawatts. And that is just the commission, Commission's assessment. If our hydrogen ambitions go beyond that, which we haven't assessed here, then we would even need more renewable energy, more wind and solar. That is absolutely critical. The pace of renewable hydrogen expansion will largely depend on our ability to ramp up renewable energy sources across Europe in particular. And having said that, let me sum this up our insights, our conclusions based on, on Guidehouse's analysis, there's a limited set of applications that really need renewable hydrogen to become climate neutral. There's a cost gap 
that we, and we therefore we need extra policy support to cover that cost gap and, and yield cost reductions. The ETS alone in the 2020s will not deliver what we need, will not deliver the stable demand for renewable hydrogen. We need an additional hydrogen policy framework, and therefore we need those instruments that can deliver the renewable hydrogen to the targeted applications where we want to see it. And as I said, we need a lot of wind and solar PV. Thank you very much. Um, giving back to Frank and handing over. Thank you, Matthias, for this great presentation. Um, we have now learned a lot on the cost cap we are expecting. And what uh, what's striking my mind the most is really the budget that we will need annually to cover for the cost differential that we see between uh, green and uh, conventional alternatives, which amounts to to the to the sum of ten to twenty four billion euros per year in the European Union. And uh, if Europe really wants to walk the talk on green hydrogen, one needs to make sure that these budgets are available. And uh, I hardly see any serious discussion on this topic as of now. And so the discussion that we are now having or entering with Matthias Schimmel on the on the policy instruments will also guide us to the question, um, who will uh, take care of the budgets required? And of course, there are different distributional effects of the policy instruments going forward. And uh, I'm, I'm happy that Matthias Schimmel from Geithaus now will guide us uh, through um, the different policy options that we are seeing and uh, explain a bit uh, in greater detail what kind of uh, specifications do we see uh, that come along with different uh, kinds of policy instruments. Please, Matthias, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you, Frank. Thank you, Matthias. I hope you can see my screen. I will now use uh, the next uh, 15 minutes to uh, give some insights into the actual policies that were already briefly mentioned uh, by Matthias. Um, so starting off with uh, the key building blocks of a hydrogen economy. So you do need additional policy instruments and not just uh, on the supply side, but also on the demand side. So you do need de-risking on the supply side. You need supply contracts. Uh, you need investment support for electricity policies, for example, and you also need exemption from taxes and levies to really bring down those electricity costs, which still make up a large proportion of then the total hydrogen cost. On the demand side, as already mentioned, carbon contract for difference to really facilitate uh, the investments, especially in the industry sector um, on uh, hydrogen-based breakthrough technologies, such as hydrogen-based direct reduction of iron, you need quotas in those sectors where hydrogen is really needed, for example, aviation, hydrogen in CHP to provide uh, flexibility to the power system, CO2 pricing, as already mentioned, is also needed but won't be sufficient. And then last but not least, you need public procurement, so certain standards uh, that then also apply the, uh, the, yeah, the public authorities uh, to procure uh, low carbon materials. Um, however, supply and demand are just uh, two aspects of the regulatory architecture. You also need infrastructure and markets. And with infrastructure, I'm particularly referring to uh, hydrogen pipelines, which are the most cost effective ways to transport hydrogen within Germany and also throughout uh, Europe. But you also need markets because in the long term, uh, we want to phase out those additional policy instruments and really have the market then um, facilitate the, the hydrogen economy. And last but not least, we also need a roof. We have the foundation, which is infrastructure and markets, but we also need system integration, which is becoming increasingly uh, important. You've just seen the number of additional renewable electricity that needs to be added to the system. And then last but not least, we need sustainability, because without sustainability criteria, there might be more emissions in the system or not the emission savings and the, the long-term goal of climate neutrality won't be met. Um, so now I'll go into the details of the various instruments, starting off with the uh, hydrogen supply contract. Here the goal is really to cover for the difference between the lowest possible renewable hydrogen production and the highest willingness to pay in a double auction model. Uh, a model. 
and then the cost gap is paid for um, during a defined time span that could be five that could be ten years uh, in an early phase, so starting already um, in a very short term, so next two years, and um, without the uh, the infrastructure in place, without hydrogen transport infrastructure in place, it will be likely integrated projects, so demand and supply together. However, then in the long term, uh, it would be really a double auction. So you would auction off the, the supply of hydrogen and then sell it uh, to the end users also via auctions to really get uh, the cost gap as as little as possible. And then just shortly coming to the legal analysis, uh, the instrument is legally feasible. However, it would qualify as state aid, uh, so it needs to be notified uh, with the Commission. Um, next up uh, would be the carbon contract for difference. Uh, here, the, 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 the goal is to really facilitate investments in breakthrough technologies by compensating the difference between the effective CO2 price and the mitigation cost of a breakthrough technology. For example, uh, for ex um, direct reduction of iron ore, we're looking at uh, mitigation costs of 100 to 150, depending on uh, the hydrogen costs, whereas the effective CO2 price is, um, well, close to zero because of free allowances, but even with uh, the, the, the CO2 prices from the ETS that are now at around 50, there is still quite a significant gap. Um, and uh, the CF CCFD could be awarded either on a project by project basis, but also in a competitive auctioning scheme where you would have, have different projects, uh, for example, within a sector, within the steel sector, but also across sectors, also looking at the chemical sector, the, um, the cement sector, competing against each other. One important additional aspect is um, that the awarded party can also sell the cream product against the premium that remunerates the implied emission reduction. However, here for um, a labeling instrument would be needed that then the off taker could sell, um, for example, the, the car that was made with green steel then to the end consumer, but the label that would uh, then make the, the end consumer pay the, the additional costs. Um, in Germany, the CCFDs will start um, already next year. Um, however, there are also discussions on, on a European level to introduce carbon contracts for difference more widely. Um, similar to the um, hydrogen supply contract, uh, the, the instrument is legally feasible, but again, uh, it would need uh, notification with the Commission. Next would be the uh, PTL quota for aviation. So aviation is really one sector where um, hydrogen is, is a no regret option. And in order to incentivize uh, um, uh, hydrogen use, which more particular would be synthetic kerosene, so e-kerosene uh, quota needs to be implemented um, also to get aviation on track uh, to cli climate neutrality by 2045 or 2050. Um, and here's a Bit of a difference to Agora. Agora assumes or would uh, propose a 10% aviation uh, or PTL quota by 2030, whereas we see also a 10% quota, but there would be a sustainable aviation fuel quota, including a sub quota of at least 5% uh, for e kerosene. The remainder would be met by bio based uh, kerosene. But the quota could be reviewed um, before 2020, 2030 and then increase um, over time. Obligated parties would be the um, kerosene distributors and the additional costs uh, could be passed on through the airline consumers. Implementation would be uh, in the coming years and then of course continue also past 2030 because uh, by 2050 all um, kerosene in the aviation sector must be climate neutral, so either bio-based or hydrogen-based. Um, coming to the legal analysis, um, the instrument is feasible. However, the, the quota must be technically achievable and place none undue burden on the obligated parties. Uh, and Fisher Tropsch is, uh, especially for e kerosene, um, is a, well, a technology that has a high TRL level. However, no um, industrial scale um, production sites do yet, uh, do yet exist. 
Um, next up would be the um, support for um, hydrogen fueled uh, combined heat and power plants, which then could provide flexibility to the power system. Um, the goal is uh, for the plant would be to receive a fixed feed in premium per unit of electricity generated, covering both uh, the capex as well as the additional opex compared to, for example, the use of natural gas. Um, the awarded CHP would need to require physical hydrogen, so it would need, need to be located um, either close to an electrolyzer or the hydrogen network. Um, then in order to really ensure flexibility, uh, the operating hours would be limited to around 3,000 hours per year. So let's pick up again at the point of um, supporting uh, hydrogen fuel CHP, and which is needed to provide flexibility to the power system. Um, I mean, th there was, of course, a discussion, do you actually need that already by, by 2030? But I think the Agora scenarios also show... Uh, quite clearly that there is already an early need for um, uh, yeah, free refurbishing uh, CHP plants and, and making them hydrogen ready. And in that sense, to support that, um, we suggest to um, provide a fixed feed-in premium per unit of um, electricity generated. Um, so similar to what's what's currently in the in the German um, uh, CHP law, and this actually could be integrated in the in the C, uh, CHP Act. Um, but yeah, focusing specifically on um, uh, CHP plants um, that are hydrogen ready, and then also use hydrogen in in this case. Um, the operating hours should be limited around 3,000 hours per year, um, just to ensure system-friendly dispatch. Because um, I mean, obviously, it's it's also not, um, yeah, CHP shouldn't shouldn't run the uh, the, the full year, but um, be used as a flexible source. I mean, that's that's the uh, whole idea of of supporting this. Um, and yeah, regarding the timing of the instrument, uh, this could be introduced in the next legislative term um, and um, eventually then be replaced by uh, by a quota for um, for hydrogen in, in CHP use um, once coal-based electricity generation has been phased out. So I, I think the initial idea here is to ensure that it's not um, the requirement for, for hydrogen doesn't uh, allow uh, more, yeah, more fossil CHP to stay in, but to really initially uh, push uh, green hydrogen in CHP into the market and then eventually make it a, a requirement through, through a quota. Um, there was also legal analysis on this, um, and yeah, the support um, should be regulated and um, conducted separate from from tendering under under the German CHP law. Um, and um, yeah, the the operating uh, hours may be uh, may be adapted, but in general terms, it's it it is legally feasible to. Um, introduce uh, uh, such a provision. Um, yeah, and uh, on, the, on the right hand, you, you see the, um, the, the cost gap uh, specifically um, regarding um, um, electricity supply of, from, from um, using renewables or uh, renewable hydrogen um, and and fossil uh, to fossil hydrogen, but that's that's a general one. Um, shall we? Is is Matthias back, or shall we move to the next instrument? We should move to the next. Okay. Which is labeling. Yeah. Then uh, let's let's move to labeling. Um, uh, yeah, labeling of green products to establish green lead markets. Uh, we think that's an important instrument um, because in the initial phase, I mean, now we talk a lot about um, actually providing policy support and, and additional funding um, 
uh, for um, uh, for green hydrogen, but eventually, I mean, we want the market to take over. Um, so the goal is to refinance investments um, in new production process, um, also from uh, from the market. And a first step towards that is is more transparency in whether the market actually uses. Uh, yeah, green green materials, green products, um, and um, I mean we already have something similar in Europe on the um, uh, on the en energy efficiency side. But you could also think of a similar label uh, on the um, yeah on the on the hydrogen side. Um, Corinna, so that, I just hear, yeah. I just see that Matthias is back. He managed to get back into Zoom. Um, so if you like, you can hand back to him. Yeah, sure. I mean, then I just gave the introduction of why why it's useful to have a label, but I think we can go a bit more into the into the details of, of the design and the timing. Um, perfect. Yeah, sorry about that. Uh, I was uh, Zoom didn't like me anymore. So apparently it's liking me again. So thank you, uh, Corinna, for taking over. Um, um, so yeah, as said, uh, labeling is, is key um, to establish those lead markets. And um, Corinna, I guess you have already presented the goal and the design. Um, the label could be introduced um, as soon as possible, and it could be part of, for example, the Eco Design Directive. Um, um, the idea of a label could, or, could also be uh, addressed in the context of the Renewable Energy Directive recast, which is expected in, in two weeks' time. Um, and um, as you can see on the right hand side, it would then look similar um, to the, the label that we currently have for electricity, just for steel. And by that, um, I want to go to the next slide. Um, if you could, yeah, and then um, I want to finalize my presentation by giving you the uh, or showing you the regulatory roadmap uh, towards a liquid hydrogen market. Um, so most of the the, the instruments that uh, were just presented uh, could already be introduced in, in the short term. So for example, the CCFD could be introduced already um, next year. Um, public procurement, labeling of green products, uh, H2 supply contracts could also really be introdu introduced in the short term um, to really get the, the market ramp up going. Um, as Matthias showed earlier, the, the ETS won't be sufficient in the short term. So we really need those additional policies quite quickly. Uh, to then by 2030 have already uh, more or less established hydrogen market and beyond 2030 some of the instruments would continue towards then establishing a full-fledged liquid hydrogen market and by that I want to uh, conclude my presentation and hand over back to Frank thank you Thank you, Matthias, uh, and sorry once more for this uh, hiccup and delay. Um, it uh, somehow appeared to me like in the 1998 semi-final of the Champions League in Madrid, where the goal broke down and uh, everybody had to wait for one and a half hours uh, until the game could start. But uh, we, we managed to uh, at least limit the time that we have been losing here. Um, now we want to hear, of course, also from an industrial perspective, what is about uh, this whole ramping up a hydrogen economy, uh, the support schemes of green hydrogen? How do you see from a, a chemical industry's perspective uh, what is needed here? I would invite Nicola Rega to, to take the floor and uh, to give us his intervention and the comments on what he has heard so far. Thank you, Frank, and uh, thank you, uh, Agora and Agivende, for the opportunity to talk to this uh, important event. I think the, the the time is absolutely crucially important. Is the right time, and, and also, I think it's uh, uh, the the angle that you have uh, approached, used to approach this, this topic. It's um, it's quite crucial. Uh, it's really about strategy, a strategic approach, and uh, I think it's definitely what we need. Um, 
here in the chemical industry, uh, we are uh, uh, nowadays the biggest, uh, among the biggest uh, producers and consumers of, of hydrogen. And uh, we definitely welcome the, uh, many of the ideas that are put forward in this report, because it's really about uh, uh, making sure that we um, uh, approach the, the industrial dimension. And, and uh, I was glad to see that um, there is a, a, a a recognition, I would say, was, was mentioned as uh, uncontested, that um, definitely looking at uh, um, using hydrogen for, for feedstock, um, it's, a, it's a clear priority and we should um, work to, to get that uh, a reality as soon as possible. Um, in in look, looking at the report and go through the presentation, I, I like to, to put forward three reflections on, on, on what I heard. Uh, which I hope can also stimulate the debate afterwards. Um, the first one, uh, I certainly need to, to, to start with the one that probably catch the, the highlights also in communication, and that is um, uh, the cost of renewable uh, uh, hydrogen generation. Um, here in, in, in the chemical industry, we, we definitely are behind the idea that we need to uh, work uh, as quickly as possible and, and in a coordinated approach to reduce the cost of renewable hydrogen. Um, CEFIC is it's involved in the European Clean Hydrogen Alliance. Um, I see that the uh, European Commission is here, so I don't want to, to preempt any presentation from the Commission side, uh, but we, we are there uh, chairing the, the roundtable industrial application of, of hydrogen. Um, our companies are present in the discussion. Uh, they have been uh, submitting projects, um, uh, and, and uh, it is clear that there is a momentum there to, to, to invest in reducing this, uh, the, this, this cost and try to make this reality um, as, pos as soon as possible uh, present in, in our uh, activities uh, uh, before 2030. Now, uh, this being said, I think the, um, you, you mentioned the cost of green hydrogens are, are impressive. Um, and there is still a, a large gap that needs to be filled. Um, I am afraid that this, the calculations might still be uh, a bit too optimistic. Uh, and the reason is uh, I'm not questioning any assumption on learning curves or anything like that. But it's mostly that um, if I look at uh, the, the graphic when we are showing that uh, with, um, we can uh, uh, optimize uh, the reproduction and reducing costs by also increasing the, the running hours. Uh, well, clearly, um, to, to, to have these uh, long running hours, uh, it is difficult to imagine that um, the, the renewable hydrogen is produced only from, uh, um, I would say, off-grid uh, renewable electricity. There will be a moment when uh, this electricity needs to be uh, coming also from the grid. Um, and, and this is where uh, uh, it gets uh, extremely expensive. Uh, I think in, in the report is mentioned uh, here and there that, uh, that there, there are, there's a need for additional measures to um, uh, address all the, the, the additional costs that come from um, uh, importing electricity uh, from the grid. Which uh, made it, um, which make the the, the, um, the overarching cost uh, of electricity going up. So the OPEX going up, even if uh, uh, renewable electricity per se is is, is reducing uh, the, the cost of, of production. So I think this is uh, uh, something we need to to work together because uh, um, uh, that is an element that we need to also be. Um, aware, uh, it, it will not be always possible to, to, to make sure that 100% um, uh, of, of um, uh, hydrogen, renewable hydrogen is produced only from uh, on, uh, with uh, um, um, renewable electricity, which is um, uh, having a direct connection uh, to the electrolyzer and only working on that direct connection. I think there is, uh, if that is the case, it might be more the exception than the rule. And we need to find a way to, to address this element as well. Um, the second point I'd like to make is on the importance of preparing the demand side. Um, I think in the presentation, uh, um, Matthias was uh, um, the first Matthias uh, was making also clear that um, there is a, a, a need to, to to secure also that there is a demand for the, the market for this, and and um, we cannot uh, run the risk of of having this kind of a chicken and egg story whereby. The hydrogen production is not developing because there is no demand, and the demand is not developing because there is no supply. Otherwise, we really end up in having a, a risk of a, a lost decade in investments. Um, 
in, in this respect, I think it's important to understand that the demand side needs to be prepared. Um, uh, it can be that uh, providing hydrogen is, is, is good enough, but in most of the cases that requires also uh, adaptation on the demand side. And, uh, and uh, to, to make this uh, smooth also in terms of cost for society, uh, I think uh, I, there was a good appreciation also of the role that low carbon hydrogen needs to play in this transition. Um, to, to make it clear from the, uh, at the end user point of view, a, a molecule of hydrogen looks the same regardless of, of how it's produced. And um, that means that uh, uh, a switch from um, a production route to the, another one um, can happen overnight, as it is happening today when uh, uh, when uh, any consumer decides to switch to uh, a green electricity. It just you change the contract. So that is. But if you don't have that demand side adapter, then it's difficult to 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 envisage. This being said, uh, I think it's clear that uh, we need to get carbon accounting right. Uh, that applies to all forms of hydrogen. Uh, we cannot end up in uh, hydrogen promotion, which uh, results in increase in uh, greenhouse gas emissions somewhere else. The, the emissions, first, they don't have to increase, and secondly, they need to reduce. So it, it's important that we get all this accounting right across all the value chains. Um, the last point I'd like to make on this specific issue is that um, uh, of, of preparing the demand side is just to bear in mind that renewable hydrogen production and renewable hydrogen consumption might not, might not be necessarily located in the same site or the same place. Um, it's, again, as it's the case also today for renewable electricity. So that is also needs to be addressed and probably will be an initial discussion afterwards. Um, my third point is on the policy instruments. Um, I, first of all, I, I appreciate that the focus on, on industry as a, because that, that has a strategic value. And I'd like to stress a moment that uh, because it's important to also to, 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 to see the big picture that um, if we manage to get the industrial transformation uh, happening in Europe, this is to me the biggest argument to convince the rest of the world in, in following the European leadership. So that is to me, uh, it, it's key priority. And also it has a, a a lot of spinover effects, which are much greater than just a simple industrial transformation. It, it, it's about uh, uh, building leadership on the, uh, the whole um, hydrogen economy value chain, um, making sure that research innovation centers are, are taking place in Europe. We create lots of indirect jobs. So there is really, it's strategic and I appreciate the, the focus on strategic developments also from, from this report. Um, there was a, a, a constant reference to con carbon control for difference, which I think it, is good. Um, but then, uh, also, as we are also discussing uh, hydrogen promotion by control for difference, I think it's probably easier just to talk about uh, control for difference, uh, full stop. Uh, and that is about uh, really uh, looking at, uh, at the overarching uh, cost gap, the cumulative cost gap, and try to address that. Um, I think the the draft uh, um, uh, aid guidelines on climate, energy, and environment, which is now up for consultation at European level, they go in that direction. We think it's it's a good approach because uh, uh, we we don't want to end up um, uh, in few years' time realizing that actually we cannot really promote this. Uh, uh, the developments because somehow the rules are segmenting the support and then, then it doesn't work. Um, Labeling, uh, uh, I think it's also important. Um, it, it's, it's a good uh, step in, in the right direction, I believe. Um, it is not sufficient uh, if then the label does not uh, translate into a commercial value. So something that uh, it has an economic value that then can be used. And, and then I think it's, uh, so it's a first step, but we need also to create uh, a market for these labels. And uh, we also need to take into consideration that things might also be uh, a bit more uh, complex when we look also at circular economy and, and uh, carbon recycling, like we talk about synthetic fuels. So how do we picture that element also in there? 
So as a for closing remark for these uh, initial uh, input statements, um, I think that the focus on, on industry, it's, 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 it's important and it's important to act now. Um, I think we are seeing a positive converg convergence when it comes to political attention, uh, uh, the, the possibility of having a more flexible approach to public financing, and also the economic, rec economic recovery, which might give uh, extra resources also for, for industrial part, for, for the private uh, elements to put, put into, into place. Um, and I, I, I'm, I feel that we might not have a second chance for having all this combination of favorable uh, situations together. So let's try to work together to get this uh, uh, window of opportunity to, up to, to, to use it in, in the most appropriate way. Thank you very much. Thanks, Nicola. Also for this um, strategic outlook and also the strategic positioning and the timing that we are currently having. Uh, which may be unique uh, going forward to implement uh, this this policy scheme that's required. Um, I now have uh, the honor also to introduce Henning Ehrenstein, who is uh, deputy head of the department uh, within the DG Grow that is responsible for um, ramping up uh, the hydrogen economy and also to to support the hydrogen use uh, in, in industrial clusters. Um, I would uh, clearly like to hear what uh, Henning Ehrenstein has to say on the European Commission's perspective on um, policy instruments bridging the hydrogen gap and helping to bring down the cost for green hydrogen, especially. Henning Ehrenstein, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, uh, Frank. Uh, thank you for the invitation to uh, join you here on that uh, panel today. Um, as you mentioned, I work uh, in the European Commission's uh, department dealing with uh, industrial policy and the internal market, um, and in particular in the, in the hydrogen team that we have created here. Um, and uh, uh, that was quite a signal in itself because so far hydrogen was exclusively dealt with in our energy department and in our research department. And we have now a few months ago set up a team here also in our industrial uh, policy uh, 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 DG, um, which uh, uh, mirrors the development of hydrogen uh, from research, much of which, of course, is still needed, to um, the uh, actual deployment uh, in the economy and the shift of focus uh, to that. Um, I uh, can say that I agree with a lot what has been uh, what has been said uh, so far during uh, during this panel. Um, I uh, just to pick out a few points I think that are uh, important. The focus of uh, hydrogen applications to um, uh, those applications where it is the most uh, useful. Um, the hydrogen strategy um, of the Commission mentions here particular uh, industry applications um, and certain but not all transport applications. Um, we heard uh, about combined heat and power plants as well. Um, we, uh, I think that's that's consensus. That's clear. Need to work both on the supply and on um, uh, the demand side and the infrastructure uh, uh, matching the two. Um, we need a lot more uh, renewable energy uh, to feed the electrolyzers. Um, the Commission um, identified in its uh, strategic risk uh, uh, paper that's attached to its uh, industrial strategy of March this year. Uh, two main risks to the uh, deployment of renewable uh, hydrogen, um, one of which is linked to raw materials needed uh, for electrolyzers, and the other one uh, is indeed the uh, availability of sufficient quantities of uh, renewable electricity. Um, then uh, also what was mentioned, uh, of course, obviously you need to bring down the cost of green hydrogen, so three cost components, I agree with all of that. Um, Electrolyzers cost uh, will come down uh, if we move from the current artisanal production of electrolyzers to uh, uh, more efficient uh, sealed productions. For this, um, the manufacturers of electrolyzers need to have signals uh, uh, that there is sufficient demand. Uh, and Nicola just spoke about uh, possible ways of, um, of creating uh, this demand and avoiding what you call the lost uh, uh, decade. Um, clearly a function of energy costs, uh, uh, and uh, we see, uh, uh, like uh, we all see, I guess, uh, a key issue with uh, 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 very, very long permitting procedures in many member states, uh, um, let's put it like this, not speeding up the um, 
uh, deployment of uh, renewable electricity installations. Um, and uh, of course, the operating hours uh, of electrolyzers um, uh, will, to a significant degree, depend on regulatory uh, frameworks and solutions um, uh, uh, that will define the parameters here. Um, and uh, as all of you know, um, we are uh, uh, in the middle of uh, uh, preparing for uh, uh, next week the Fit for 55 um, package. So, um, as I said, share a lot of what has been said. But what are we actually going to? What are we actually doing about this? It's nice to share the assessment, but um, so uh, there is three or four fronts that that we are working on. I think to overcome this chicken and egg problem and to work and bring together supply and demand side, we set up the uh, European Clean Hydrogen Alliance that was already referred to, um, which really brings together the, the EU hydrogen community, around 1,400 members, um, many of which are companies that are active in uh, uh, certain parts of the hydrogen value chain, um, but often quite isolated to their one part. And we need to bring together these different parts of the, uh, of the hydrogen industry and of the value chain. Um, because one thing is also clear, um, is that the uh, projects these different stakeholders uh, pursue will be much more attractive to attract the financing that they need um, if uh, uh, it is clear uh, how they relate together and if they maybe have a certain uh, size and, and integration uh, uh, as well um, so that you can address offtake risks uh, uh, um, and also uh, find best ways to address technology risks. So um, the alliance really brings together the community. Um, uh, it focuses on uh, hydrogen applications, indeed, uh, uh, in, uh, in industry, uh, uh, in certain transport applications, in, in the power sector that was also mentioned here, uh, and to a degree in the building sector as well, though, I mean, we're all aware of the, the controversies there. Um, it's trying to, uh, it, 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 we are running matchmaking sessions whereby, you know, the different stakeholders come together and try to build these more integrated projects I refer to um, and um, uh, try to come up with a pipeline of projects to be presented to um, financial investors by the end of the year. Um, many of you mentioned the uh, importance of uh, uh, public financing to cover the cost gap, especially in uh, uh, an initial period, uh, which may, however, last uh, uh, a little while. Um, so uh, uh, CCFD was mentioned. Uh, it's also mentioned in the in the hydrogen strategy itself. Um, it's no secret that um, a focus of us is to work on uh, so-called IPCIs, important projects of common European interest, which are a means for the European Commission to clear significant amounts of state aid um, uh, given uh, uh, by uh, member states, and we welcome very much that many member states under their recovery and resilience facilities and the EU uh, uh, budget facilities to come out of the, um, of the corona crisis um, have made hydrogen a, a significant priority. So uh, we're working closely with member states and industry to design these IPCIs, which is not a simple process, but I think the examples of semiconductors and batteries um, uh, where IPCIs were set up shows that this can be a very powerful uh, uh, tool. Um, I mentioned it already, the, uh, a lot will depend on the, on the regulatory design, uh, and I think everyone is keen to see um, the details of the uh, uh, Fit for 55 package coming out 14 July, and uh, uh, to which we're currently putting the, the finishing touches. Um, a lot of discussion, of course, also on um, different types of uh, hydrogen blue versus uh, green. I think the EU uh, Taxonomy Delegated Act adopted on 4 June um, sets here some important uh, parameters when it comes to the, um, uh, the definition also of low carbon hydrogen production. I mean, one of your presentations you referred uh, to um, the assumption of CCS of about 75%, um, which is roughly in line with what's in the in the uh, Taxonomy uh, Delegated Act. So um, happy to, to take any uh, questions uh, uh, comments later during the debate, but um, these are just a couple of uh, thoughts from my side at this stage. Thank you.
Frank? Yeah, here oh. I am. Do you... Thank oh. you very much. Good. I thought Thank we you. lost someone else. Sorry. No, no, uh, <laughs> just just had a short hiccup. Uh, Thank you, Henning, for for your explanation and also uh, the view of uh, the Commission on on this very important issue. Um, we now want to turn our head um, more towards our audience uh, that uh, already raised a lot of questions. I have seen that uh, Pia and Nefko already answered a couple of them in the in the uh, question and answers section. But of course, we want to discuss some of the questions also here live uh, on the panel. And therefore, Nevko, I would uh, invite you to, to come in and uh, give us some questions that uh, you have seen very prominently in the, in the Q&A session uh, and that we can discuss here also on the panel. Cool. Yeah. Thanks a lot, Frank. So there have, there have been a number of really good questions. And maybe um, maybe let's start with a question that, that's di directed um, to Nicola. Um, there, there, is, um, th there are, I think, two questions that are specifically targeted at, at two uh, panelists. So, um, yeah, this question of um, the question is, it's unclear what Nicola meant by changing contracts to green electricity and how many chemical sectors actually need molecules provided by gas as a feedstock, which cannot be easily replaced by green electricity contracts. Yeah, uh, th th thanks for the opportunity to reply uh, live also because I, I would like to avoid that there has been any misunderstanding from my side also with other uh, uh, participants on, on the list. Um, first of all, the point I wanted, I wanted to make is that um, if you have a delivery of, of molecules uh, um, to, to your in site, uh, and I was making a parallelism with a delivery of electrons with electricity, then uh, the moment you're having those molecules coming and um, they, these molecules look the same regardless of how they're produced, then the, the point I was trying to make is that you can um, switch the source of, 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 uh, of production by basically signing a different type of contract, and then you can secure um, different types of molecules coming in. So, the, and I was trying to make the parallelism that that's also what is happening in electricity when you are changing your contract and you can sign a, a public uh, power purchasing agreements, PPAs, that's also a way of doing it. So that, that, that was uh, what I was trying to make with the parallelism. I hope that now is, is clarified. Um, from our side, we, uh, yeah, you, you cannot just switch to, electricity on, on, on everything. And the most importantly for us, uh, as we discussed before, uh, also mentioned in, in the presentation from, uh, from the report, uh, our priority is uh, about uh, um, uh, securing our feedstock. So uh, hydrogen as a feedstock. And that is uh, for us the key, key component in this discussion. And then the energy part comes uh, as an add-on, but that can be addressed in different ways. Okay, thanks, Nicola, for the clarification. Uh, Nefko, what else have we got? Well, there's a really interesting question. Um, so given the permitting issues limiting growth of renewable generation capacity, especially in Germany and France, um, as well as the affordability concerns um, with German power bills being among the highest in Europe, will there be an appetite in Germany and other major European countries to provide 10 to 20 billion uh, yearly policy support for green hydrogen? Who wants to take this? Uh, Matthias, uh, do we have any indication on this? Or maybe even Matthias Schimmel, uh, since you're also uh, deeply in discussions with the Federal Ministry of the Economy uh, from Gartel's side, is there any indication on what, uh, what, yeah, what, how is this seen in the, in the German policy arena? Um, maybe I can make a start. So, um... I can maybe speak from the from the German perspective. Uh, so it's also about kind of like industrial policy, right? Uh, they do want to have, do want to keep those basic materials in Germany. So we're talking about cement, uh, chemicals, um, um, steel. So it's a matter of supporting the transition of of those those industries and also keep employment. So it's not just uh, spending money; it's also investing into uh, industries that provide employment, that provide to the GDP. Um, so, yeah, so it's not purely seen as spending, it's also as yeah something to create investment and opportunities and also potentially then export opportunities. 
and especially in the link to the power builds to to and put in ad additional support on uh, on uh, support scheme on the power sector where we already have to bear the high costs of the renewables going forward. Yes, if you like, I could add to yeah. that. Um, well, I think uh, what we see is that by now renewables are quite cheap. So, I mean, they, they won't add to the power bill as they did in the past, but it's also quite clear that the um, German green hydrogen demand won't come entirely from, from German renewables, but that uh, Germany will have to cooperate with other countries within and outside Europe. I saw there were also some, some questions in the chat on like, for example, cooperation with MENA, which I think is, is really important. Um, from from a German perspective, but also if you look at the um, cheap renewables potentials in the North Sea and in the south of Europe, um, I think that's that will be quite crucial to um, yeah not not do that entirely in in Germany. So that's uh, that's probably clear from the German government perspective. Yeah, and uh, we have of course the discussion to finance. Uh, the EEG support through other mechanisms in Germany already, so that we can somehow um, get down something uh, of the of the power bills that we're already seeing. So this eventually may free room for other support schemes to also be implemented. Um, Jefko, what what else have we got in the in the audience questions? So well, maybe just on the back of what Corinna said about um, about those imports from other countries, how should renewable hydrogen imports be treated uh, by the EU? So outside, of, how should the imports from outside of EU be treated by the EU? Uh, I would uh, really like to hear Henning's position and Henning's view on this. How, how is the Commission uh, thinking about this? Uh, how will they make uh, uh, imports accessible to the European Union and what role should they play? Yeah, thank you very much. Um, just to um, also emphasize, uh, before I come to that point, the importance that we in the Commission uh, give to the social dimension um, of uh, the entire Fit for 55 package, which would have as one of its elements uh, 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 something on that. Um, our Executive Vice President, Franz Timmermans, uh, who uh, uh, is in charge for main elements of the package, is very um, conscious of uh, the social dimensions. Uh, Gilets jaunes uh, uh, in France uh, uh, were... Uh, uh, or are still on many people's minds um, in this regard, I'd say. Um, on uh, the issue of imports, uh, the Commission Hydrogen Strategy very clearly says that there is going to be a role uh, for uh, clean hydrogen imports. If you look at the uh, uh, production costs uh, uh, of clean hydrogen in different uh, geographic locations, there is an obvious uh, business case uh, uh, for uh, locations uh, in our, uh, for example, southern but also eastern uh, neighborhood countries. Um, a lot will then depend on uh, the uh, price you have to add to that for the transport of that hydrogen to uh, 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 the industrial centers in Northwest Europe. Um, clearly, uh, as we all know, uh, uh, pipeline uh, transmission is uh, by far the most cost efficient. Um, uh, uh, liquefied uh, 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 transport is probably not. Um, so yes, uh, uh, recognition of the fact uh, by the Commission that there is um, a, a dimension for the import of renewable hydrogen uh, from outside uh, the EU and in particular from our um, uh, uh, direct neighboring countries. Um, that said, um, before uh, looking outside, um, we uh, of course always advocate looking inside um, and uh, you have big differences within uh, uh, the EU as well. You see a very important uh, green hydrogen production project um, being uh, planned and financing under these uh, recovery and resilience plans that I mentioned uh, foreseen in countries such as uh, Spain, uh, uh, Portugal, uh, Greece, uh, also Italy, um, that uh, uh, can, uh, uh, and that is the intention, uh, 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 supply uh, hydrogen to um, uh, places where it is needed uh, uh, other than in these countries. Um, that uh, brings us to the uh, uh, issue of um, the uh, infrastructure, transmission infrastructure uh, network that is needed that was also uh, uh, raised earlier. But uh, in summary, so we do see a role for imports, um, but we also see a very big role um, for uh, uh, hydrogen uh, trade within the EU. 
thank you, Henning, uh, on this. Nefko, other topics we need to tackle in this round? Yeah, I think there is um, there is, there are some interesting questions about the the policy instrument for sustainable aviation fuels. So there is a question. Actually, there is two questions. Um, first question is, what is the reason for choosing a power to liquids quota over a CO2 reduction quota in aviation fuels? And more broadly in the transport area, how does this approach of focusing on 5 to 10 percent of aviation sustainable, sustainable aviation fuels and little mention of heavy duty trucking, shipping, etc. align with Germany's commitment for 55 percent carbon emission reduction by 2030? I would uh, clearly like to guide us to enter the discussion on the first topic, and maybe Matthias, uh, you could come on on the Matthias Deutsch, you could come on the second part of the question. Uh, thank you. Um, so uh, the reason really is that, uh, um, as said earlier, um, we really see the aviation sector as a key sector to apply hydrogen-based fuels, uh, whereas in the other sectors you do have other options. As already mentioned by Matthias Deutsch, you have um, controversial or also uh, like uh, bad ideas, so especially in passenger cars. So aviation is really key, and you don't really have that many options. So you have e kerosene and you have bio based kerosene. So I don't think that a um, a reduction based uh, system would make th that much of a difference. Whereas if you have quotas, that also gives a clear signal to investors and it gives certainty that there will be a certain amount required at a certain time. So that, those will be uh, my answers. And then, yeah, handing over to you, Matthias Deutsch. Yes, thank you. <clears throat> if I understood the second part correctly, it's about kind of the consistency of the German trajectory from minus 55 by 2030. And it's true that, uh, as I said at the outset, that the entire study is motivated by our own climate neutral Germany study, 2045. And it's true that for 2030, there is um, an, an amount of PTL, but it's not uh, as large in that scenario as what we suggest here for this uh, 2030 target of 10% of a 10% quota in aviation. How would you reconcile that? Let me underline the need for signaling towards others outside of the EU. You may find that over ambitious, and as, as I said, this is where it guide us and we deviate a bit, but the signal needs to be sufficiently strong that all those who make their living currently, countries and uh, companies alike, on supplying fossil fuels need to see a clear future path and a disruption of future fossil markets if we want to be ever consistent with climate neutrality. Shaping this transformation in the export countries, and it will be easier for many <clears throat> to produce PTL than within Europe in those volumes, is about early and clear signaling, even knowing that we don't have those huge, uh, very large scale fissure trough uh, um, processes today in, in actual plants, there needs to be a very, very fast ramp up. And then Europe should be there to actually buy those climate uh, neutral products. With one caveat, just to mention that, and you find that in the footnotes in our report, this will not make flying entirely climate neutral. Just keep in mind the non-CO2 effects of flying. And we have more to do than just substituting usual kerosene, conventional kerosene with PTL. This is not doing the entire job of becoming climate neutral. Thank you, Matthias. Um, since we had this technical hiccup in between, uh, I would assume that we take another five to 10 minutes uh, in the webinar if it's fine with also the panelists uh, doing so and would um, take some other questions from the audience uh, that we may discuss. Nefko. Well, sure. There is. Um, there have been some interesting uh, questions on uh, going into more detail on carbon contra contracts for difference. So uh, this is this this is quite a complex question, but it has many parts to it. But um, so carbon contracts could, carbon contracts for difference could only be applied with a ETS price. If so, could you give an opinion on how to apply them to places with hard car carbon prices? Uh, Yes. And the second part of this question is, do you think that carbon contracts for difference could lead to a sort of overproduction? Um, should they be tied to actual selling and quantity of products? And finally, um, car we mentioned that carbon contracts for difference should start as soon as possible. What's the first 
reasonable date for the first uh, C CCFD to be awarded. Well, a couple of great questions. And uh, Nicola, if you were to come in and uh, maybe you could also uh, take another step to elaborate a bit why you said uh, carbon contracts for difference is, is not such a, um, or shouldn't be the only idea under consideration. You talked more on the CFD approach. And um, if you could maybe um, try to get this also a bit in your answer, why you think this uh, should be tackled from that direction. Yeah, sure. Thanks for the opportunity. And actually, thanks to uh, Emanuele Bianco for the excellent question, because it really gives, uh, it requires a bit of, of uh, elaboration of the answer. Um, th the reason why I was uh, going beyond the carbon contract for difference is, uh, is primarily because um, to, to, to get an example from the discussion, from the report that came out, um, uh, as uh, the graphics that were shown by Matthias, um, they were showing that the, the, even with the carbon price of, 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 I don't remember how many hundreds of euros, there was still uh, uh, not, not enough. But then that, that means that even if you would uh, create that compensation, you might still be not enough in, in getting there. Um, secondly, because um, as I was mentioning, uh, if we go into uh, renewable uh, hydrogen production, whereby we will also need to get electricity from the grid, then uh, uh, those extra costs, they, they, they will not be covered by the carbon contract for difference, but they will have to be covered by something else. So I think if we manage to bundle all these uh, different elements into what is really the, 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 the spread in, 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 uh, in the price that is required to make the investment uh, workable, I think it, it will simplify a lot of things. And, and, and I feel that the, the approach that is being taken by the European Commission, at least from DG competition in, in the consultation, seems to be going in that direction, which I think it, it, it simplifies a lot of, of things. Otherwise, we need to uh, introduce different permit with different uh, um, requests for state aid for different components under different items. So I think that's going to be uh, that that could be, if you would go that direction could be an obstacle in, in developing these technologies. Um, so th that's what and the uh, counter for difference. I mean, it, carbon counter for difference seems a new concept, but I mean, I mean because we are applying to, to carbon, but it's uh, we've been calling until now uh, a feeding a premium is it's the same, it's a contract for difference. So we know what it is, we know how to handle it. So I think it shouldn't be a problem. Um, overproduction, I don't think so, because uh, what it's doing is, is, uh, is uh, covering the gap between uh, the current price of, of, I would say, high carbon uh, production and uh, the, the gap with low carbon production. You will still end up with the same price, because you're using a, a low carbon product instead of a high carbon product. So I, I don't think that's going to be a, a problem. Um, when can it start? Uh, I, I think from the, the 1st of January of next year, um, in the sense that the governments can um, already start planning how to design it. And uh, I, I, I'm not speaking under surveillance from, from handing from the commission, but um, uh, as far as I remember, if um, there is an expectation that uh, there is a change in, in regulation and that the new state guidelines are specifically uh, allowing for this, uh, this approach to, to, to work out, the governments can already start preparing the ground so that then when the new guidelines come into place, you can start really doing the, all the work. So to me, uh, there is no significant reason for, for technical reason for delaying the work and to discuss the parameters. It's just a matter of political willingness to do so. But I'll leave it to maybe other colleagues to complement my uh, reaction. Yeah, Matthias Schimmel, um, you maybe want to come in on this yeah, as well, especially sure. also uh, eventually on the lead times that you would you see what we would need for such an instrument as if CCFDs to be implemented. Thank you. So maybe on the first point on the, the, the ETS. So, I mean, the CCFD is targeting the, the industry sector where the ETS is already the, the key in this, uh, instrument today. So there you have a natural link, uh, you have a sector where hydrogen is really needed and you have a CCFD that also then strengthens the role of the ETS further and also kind of incentivizes policymakers to make uh, the, uh, the ETS even more stringent. Um, and then for other sectors, you would have carbon contracts for different, so not carbon contract for different. For example, the, the H2 supply contracts that were mentioned earlier 
in regards to, to overproduction. Uh, I don't see this as a, as a really big issue. It would be more replacing current uh, production capacities with low carbon production capacities. And then towards uh, the lead time, the dates. So uh, we see already a lot of initiatives from the industry. There are certain industrial stakeholders that want to switch to hydrogen-based technologies already in the upcoming years. So for example, the steel industry, where they could use uh, natural gas to a certain extent, but they could also already blend in hydrogen. So therefore, a CFD uh, would need to be required as of already next year to make the to give the, the investment certainty and the same is true for um, for the chemical industry where you do have uh, um, uh, yeah you do need to plan ahead five sometimes even ten years and that's why you need the certainty as soon as possible thank you Matthias um, Nefko give us the last question that we can deal with before wrapping up and closing the session. Well, um, so there is a, a question about steam methane reforming and its free allowances under the uh, ETS scheme. So would it not be easier solution to push for green hydrogen or, or carbon le leakage is too much of a risk? Who wants to tackle this? Well, perhaps I give it a start. So um, on the side of the Commission, we're quite clear that the priority is um, the uh, production and application of renewable hydrogen. And that's why the hydrogen strategy includes targets for the production of renewable hydrogen and does not include targets for the production of uh, other low carbon hydrogen. Um, at the same time, we recognize that um, we are not going to have the renewable hydrogen uh, supply uh, uh, available in the numbers that we need in the short term. Um, and therefore advocate that in a transition period, uh, and our Sprachregelung is in the short term to medium term, uh, the use of uh, low carbon hydrogen. Um, being aware of, and I think that was a comment in, in one of the, uh, in the chat as well, um, about uh, lock-in risks. Um, if we look at it from an industrial uh, uh, policy perspective, um, you will hear, uh, for example, my commissioner uh, Thierry Breton um, say that we have developed a, um, in Europe a lead on hydrogen technologies that we now need to commercialize and bring to market so that we don't make uh, the mistakes that we have made in other key strategic uh, industries where Europe has developed technologies um, and then uh, our partners in America or Asia have commercialized them. And um, that uh, uh, bringing to market will require the availability of uh, uh, hydrogen that is less carbon intensive than the hydrogen that we have at the moment. And that's where you come to the role for uh, low carbon hydrogen. But we want to be very clear that politically this is uh, in a transition phase. Um, our our priority um, clearly is uh, renewable hydrogen. Thank you. Any additions from the panelists? Other than that, I would say thank you to all of you for this very interesting discussion that we had. Thank you also to the people uh, in the audience for your composure and for your patience you had with us and our technical hiccups that we were experiencing. Um, I hope we nevertheless could contribute a bit to um, yeah, a huge challenge uh, in the debate of how to get down the cost for renewable hydrogen in the future, how to bridge the cost gap, um, and uh, also maybe on the time frame, what is needed uh, to, to set up a regulatory architecture that finally works and makes us walking the talk on the role of hydrogen, green hydrogen, low carbon hydrogen in this industrial and economic transformation we are foreseeing. Um, I would now hand over to Nicola for the final, final remarks and for closing the session. Thank you, Frank. Thank you, dear panelists, and also to the audience. Um, we have the presentation and the study on our website, and Maxi will post the link again into the chat to make sure you find them. The recording will be online in a couple of days, I would think. 
And um, if you'd like to be kept up to date on the latest study of Agora or on upcoming events, um, we will close now for the summer, but we'll be back after summer, that's for sure. Um, you can register for our newsletter to always be kept up to date. We will also put a link from Guidehouse into the chat um, to find more information on them there. And other than that, I wish everyone a great summer or to the Australians amongst the audience uh, a good winter, not too cold. And um, we'll be back soon and enjoy the rest of your day or night or whatever time it is now in your time zone. And we will remain for a few more seconds on the podium so you can easily stroll out of the room. And um, yeah, take care. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.